Hey Optimancers, Chris here. So last week I did a video with Colby from D&D Optimized and we did a poll for viewers to pick which subclass we were going to do a build for. And one of the things I mentioned in that video was I was secretly hoping Clockwork Sorcerer Soul would win because I really like the Clockwork Soul Sorcerer. And in general I've found that people are a little more excited about the Aberrant Mind Sorcerer from Tasha's than the Clockwork Soul. And I personally disagree. I like the Clockwork Soul Sorcerer more. I like both Sorcerers a lot. But Clockwork Soul, because of Clockwork Magic, just for me is a nicer mix of spellcasting. They get just a fantastic mix of spells to the point where I think at certain levels they're more versatile in a lot of ways than a wizard is. And that is really something when you're talking about a sorcerer and you can throw metamagic on top of that kind of versatility in spellcasting. We can do a lot of things with it. So the build I'm going to present today, I'm going to be playing. Uh, and with a lot of builds I do, I don't necessarily play them because I do more builds than I play in games. So I just can't play them all. This one I'm 100% going to play because this is the kind of character I love to play. And this isn't a character build that relies on a gimmick. Uh, I've done builds like the Shock Chalk recently that relies on a particular gimmick or interaction with the rules to do something that you wouldn't normally see. In this case, uh, there are of course interactions in the rules I'm going to take advantage of, but the main portion of this is simply playing a well-balanced and versatile spellcaster that has the right spell for every situation. And I think it's appropriate that I do a build that does that right now because I've found that not all spellcasters, even at high levels, always have the spells that are right for the particular situation. But before I get into this build, I do want to thank some of my top level patrons. Patrons help support this channel and my patrons get rewards like early ad free versions of these videos. And in addition, my top level patrons can join me for some one shots each month. And I'm actually going to talk about that a little bit in this video. But today specifically, I want to thank Ed Iverson, Eric Harvey, Eric Wasserman, Geek Dice, Glenn Wilson, I'm Not K, Jay Gemmel, James Sprague, James Thomas, and John Matera. Thank you all so much for your continued support. Let's get started. So back in the early 2000s, I wrote my first wizard guide, which got some attention and got me a little bit known in the optimization community. And one of the things I mentioned in that is that the best wizard can do three things fairly well. Now that doesn't mean those are the only things a good wizard can do, but in general, a wizard should be able to debuff their enemies, control the battlefield and buff their allies. And what I've seen actually in recent one shots, and I run one shots for my Archmage level patrons, and we are high level now. We're currently going into 17th level play, and but we've recently done 16th and 15th level play. And I've noticed a lot of spellcasters, wizards and sorcerers, that have a lot of options for battlefield control and for debuffing, but buffing is ignored. And I completely understand why, because one thing I do on this channel is spell evaluation and I'll take a look at two different spells and one of the spells I'm going to rate green because I think it's a good spell and another one I'll rank purple because I think it's not as good according to my analysis as the other spell. But that doesn't mean that making the best caster is looking for the spells that got rated the highest and then filling your list with those spells. You need to look for a good balance of spells and that means finding spells that fill different niches and that no matter what your situation, you always have something you can do. This character is always going to have something they can do. I recently ran a one shot for high level characters and there was a big bad enemy at the end. That enemy had 
teleportation as a legendary action. So trapping them in a wall of force or a force cage just didn't work. They also had a good charisma save, so the force cage didn't hold them. And their saving throws were good, and they had legendary resistances. So hitting them with those spells that they make a save, and if they make their save, nothing happens, was a terrible option. They also had resistance to the damage from spells. So hitting him with damage spells wasn't particularly effective either, because usually they had save, and then on top of that, they're having the damage. And I had comments from a couple different people playing spellcasters that they felt like their character could do nothing. And I want to talk a little bit about how we would address that while making a character with this build. So I'm going to present today Tough the Buff. I'm going to go ahead and take this build to 20th level, but honestly, I think... The important parts of this build we're going to see by level 13. But I have all the levels timestamped on the video timeline so you can access the parts you need when you need it. Also, as always, the completed version of this character is available in the video description. There is one thing I do need to mention though, and that is that D&D Beyond, which is what I use for character building, has not updated their system to take care of clockwork magic yet. Same with aberrant magic. So that means I'm going to have to show you what kind of clockwork spells I have available on a different screen, and they will not show on the completed character build. So to begin with, tough the buff, we need magic the gathering content turned on. If you do not have access to magic the gathering in your campaign, there are other ways to make this character, but it doesn't work quite as well. And I'm assuming our optional features from Tasha's are available. So we're going to have turned on optional class features and customize your origin. The race I am selecting is the Hill Dwarf. Now any dwarf will work for this build, but dwarf is the right race for this build. If we look at our dwarf traits, you're going to see that we get a constitution boost to plus two, and we're going to get an additional boost to plus one. I'm going to be switching those anyways. They're medium sized, but the important part here is our speed. Our base walking speed is 25 feet. Our speed is not reduced by wearing heavy armor. This is a build that is going to wear heavy armor and have a low strength score. So to all the people there who have alarm bells going off, let me explain that if you do not meet the strength requirement of heavy armor, the only penalty you are given is a reduction to movement speed. So if we are playing a dwarf, we can ignore the strength requirements of heavy armor. In addition, we're going to have dark vision, dwarven resilience, which is resistance to poison damage and advantage on saving throws against the poison condition. And then we get dwarven combat training, tool proficiency, stone cutting, they are not particularly important to the build. The reason I've chosen Hill Dwarf is for Dwarven Toughness. Our hit point maximum increases by one and increases by one every time you gain a level. So that is the additional hit points we would expect from having a two point higher constitution score. And I figure this is a good idea on a build that is going to be primarily Sorcerer. Because Sorcerer has the lowest die type possible for hit points, which is a D6. So that additional hit point per level does make a difference. It puts us more in line with the rest of the characters. But as I said, any dwarf will work for this build. But assuming we go hill dwarf, there's two changes we need to make using our customizer origin, and that are the ability scores. Now, the rest of the stuff, you can change it if you want. You're not going to get much use out of proficiency in warhammers, for example. So you could trade it out for a tool proficiency. But for this build, just the important parts are the two ability scores. And what we're going to do is we're going to make our plus two for charisma and our plus one for constitution. And the way that looks once we do our point by for ability scores is a strength of eight, dexterity of 10, constitution of 16, intelligence of 10, wisdom of 13, and charisma of 17. And one of the reasons I like to have those odd scores on the primary ability score now is there are so many great options now for half feats that that makes that 17 a fair bit better than a 16 to start with because once we start adding feats we're getting the benefit of the half feat on top of the 18 charisma obviously background you can choose whatever you want my thought for this character is that they were a dwarven engineer who made machinery for the dwarves and so I chose Guild Artisan. 
It gives me insight and perception and Tinker's tools. And any dwarf who deals in machinery, Gnomish makes sense for the language. Now the class we're going to start with is Clockwork Soul Sorcerer. I will be multiclassing into Cleric, but I'll do it at second level. And the reason I'm going to do that is so that I get the proficiency with constitution saves right at level one. And it is going to be one level that is going to be a little uncomfortable because generally first level sorcerers aren't that tough to begin with. With Clockwork Soul, we're going to get Restore Balance. This gives us the ability to use our reaction to remove advantage or disadvantage from a check. Now the main thing I could see doing this on is, let's say a creature has magic resistance, you could use Restore Balance to basically neutralize that magic resistance on a saving throw against one of your spells. Though if ever you have a situation where you have an enemy, maybe they're invisible and the fighter's going to attack them, you could use it as well to just give them a straight up attack roll. Not a lot of uses of this ability. We can do it twice at first level. We'll eventually be able to do it six times and it's recovered after a long rest. It's an okay ability, nothing too flashy. By far, the most powerful ability that Clockwork Magic Soul Sorcerers get is Clockwork Magic. This gives us an additional two spells known every other level right up to level nine. Our ninth level sorcerer is going to have twice as many spells known as a standard ninth level sorcerer. So that creates a huge amount of spell versatility. Now the Aberrant Mind gets a similar ability, but the thing that makes this one better is first off, the base spells provided are better. And secondly, we can switch these spells. When we gain a sorcerer level, we can switch this with another spell of the same level, and we can do so from the abjuration or transmutation lists from the sorcerer, warlock, or wizard spell list. So the way I read that, and there's certainly an argument that you might be able to switch a spell right at first level, though I would suggest that when you make a first level character, that doesn't count as gaining a level in sorcerer. So the way I read it, you can switch a spell every level starting at second level. With the Aberrant Mind Sorcerer, they are limited to the Divination or Enchantment list. Now, there are good spells on Divination and Enchantment that you can switch those spells for, and I'm not saying otherwise, but if we're talking about building a balanced character, there is a lot more versatility in the Abjuration and Transmutation schools. And I think it's important to mention that the sorcerers get a class ability allowing them to switch out spells for other spells every time they gain a level in sorcerer as well. These are two separate abilities, so you are not limited to one or the other. You can do them both, at least the way I read it. So I think you'll find that once we get to ninth level and we look at what spells we have on our clockwork soul list and then add them to the spells we have through our sorcerer list, it creates a fantastic collection of spells. So for our base sorcerer spells, we're going to get four cantrips and two first level spells known. And the cantrips I'll select are number one, I'm going to take Firebolt. That is a just an okay ranged cantrip. Gives us something to do when we're not casting a leveled spell. Does a d10 damage, scales with level, and it can attack objects, which is useful as well. Second cantrip I'll take is Mage Hand. That is just a useful utility cantrip. Then I will be taking Mind Sliver. Now, the thing about Mind Sliver is it allows you to do an attack cantrip on a creature without making an attack roll. So you don't have to worry about armor class. You don't have to worry if they have half or three quarters cover. And Mind Sliver hits intelligence saves, which are usually weaker saving throws. And if they fail their save as an addition, they're going to have a minus D4 on the next saving throw they make before the end of your next turn. Damage is a D6, which kind of sucks, but because we have that additional effect and we're hitting a weaker saving throw, it's still a pretty good spell. And finally, I'm going to take Minor Illusion. Minor Illusion is a very versatile spell. And with our first level spells, we're going to get two known spells from being a sorcerer. The first one I'm going to select is Sleep. Sleep is pretty much always the spell you want to select as a first level sorcerer because it is probably the most powerful spell you can have when you're a first level character. You have an area of effect, there's no saving throw, and creatures affected are removed from combat. The only limitation is hit points. 
you're going to roll 5d8, and that's how many hit points of creatures are going to fall asleep automatically. And this is when I say that sleep is a really good spell at first level. It does not stay a good spell, because 5d8 hit points is a lot of hit points at first level. But once we get to third level and above, creatures often have enough hit points that a sleep spell won't even affect a single creature. So this is definitely a spell we will be switching out, but right now it is the best spell we can choose. Second spell we're going to take is Shield. Shield is a good defensive spell, uses your reaction, gives you a plus 5 armor class against all attacks until the beginning of your next turn. And this combines with armor, it combines with carrying a regular shield, which we're going to be doing both of next level. Now, at first level, I'm likely not casting shield at all. I'm going to try to just stay back and keep myself out of the targets of the enemies. And I'll cast a couple sleep spells. Otherwise, I'm mainly going to just be doing fire bolts. Then, because we are a clockwork soul sorcerer, we are going to get alarm and protection from evil and good at first level. I will likely not cast either of these spells. So at second level, we are going to multi-class, and we're going to take a level of cleric. And the domain we are going to choose is the order domain. I think thematically this is a perfect fit for clockwork, because we're talking about modrons, which are kind of the embodiment of law, and the order domain is a perfect fit for that. Also, mechanically, it is the right fit as well. We're going to get two domain spells, which are Command and Heroism. Now, I will not be casting Command with this character, and the reason is because it is based off my Wisdom. My Wisdom is not that great, so it just doesn't give me enough chance of success. But Heroism is definitely a spell I might cast. I'll talk about that in a bit. We're also going to get the Intimidation skill for free, and that works actually really well for us because we happen to be a Charisma-based character. We are also going to get proficiency with Heavy Armor. This is a must, so if Magic of the Gathering content isn't available, then you could take a different Cleric subclass, but you want to take one that's going to give you Heavy Armor proficiency. So now that we have proficiency in Heavy Armor and Shields, what we want to do is get Heavy Armor and a Shield. And at this level, we're not going to be able to afford a lot, but you know what? Chainmail isn't that expensive, and a Shield is not expensive at all. And then we're going to get Voice of Authority, and this is the reason we're choosing this subclass. You can invoke the power of law to embolden an ally to attack. If you cast a spell with a spell slot of first level or higher and target an ally with that spell, that ally can use their reaction immediately after the spell to make one weapon attack against a creature of your choice that you can see. If the spell targets more than one ally, you choose the ally who can make the attack. Now, this has a couple things that are lovely. The first thing is it doesn't specify the spell has to be a cleric spell. That means that when we cast a sorcerer spell, if an ally is targeted, then they will get the voice of authority attack option. And the second is, it doesn't say that the spell even has to be beneficial. And that's going to come up, and I'll talk about that more when it does. The three cantrips I'm going to be selecting here are Guidance, Mending, and Spare the Dying. Guidance is the best cleric cantrip in my opinion, and it doesn't rely on our wisdom in any way. Then we have Mending, which is a useful utility cantrip, and Spare the Dying, which we can use to stabilize a dying ally. And Spare the Dying isn't something I always jump on with clerics, because we usually have a number of healing options that are better than Spare the Dying. This isn't really going to be a healing character, though, so Spare the Dying is something I could see actually having use of. And we are going to have a ton of cantrips with this character, so we can fit Spare the Dying quite easily. Heroism is another spell that we're going to occasionally use. Now, Heroism is super circumstantial, but when we cast it on somebody, they gain immunity to the Frightened Condition, and they get some temporary hit points that replenish. The temporary hit points are really small, but the main reason you would cast Heroism is for the Fear Immunity, and quite often we might even cast it after the cause. So you have a lot of creatures that have these Area of Effect Fear Conditions, the entire party makes their saving throws, and somebody failed their saving throw. Well, that's when you would cast Heroism on them, and then they get the immunity to that Frightened Condition that they would otherwise have to deal with. And in some cases, it's even worse. Sometimes their action is used up as well. 
But regardless, Frightened is a pretty bad condition to be under. So, so being able to cast a first level spell at need and take care of it is well worth it. Then we are going to get two first level spell selections. Easily, my first choice is Bless. Bless is a spell that remains an excellent spell, even at very high level. Honestly, Bless never gets bad. You can be a 20th level character, and Bless is still a decent spell, because those D4 on the saving throw is still often going to make a failure into success, and that D4 on attack rolls is often still going to make a miss into a hit. And the spells and effects that you're saving against continue to scale. And the attacks that you are making continue to scale. And we can use Bless and take advantage of our Voice of Authority to give an ally a weapon attack. And who are we going to give that to? Ideally, the Rogue. And I should say that. If you are going to make this character for a campaign, and other players are wondering what to play, let somebody know that if they were to play a Rogue, you can provide their reaction attack for them a lot of the time. Because a rogue who makes a reaction attack when it's not their turn can make a second sneak attack in a round. That's why it's so good when mixed with rogue. Now, Shield of Faith is the second spell we're going to take. Probably going to cast it less. It uses our concentration, but we can cast it on somebody else, and it's only a bonus action to cast. So if we are taking a different action, Shield of Faith is something we can still cast. It also has a pretty decent range at 60 feet, so we can target an ally with it. I would very seldom cast it on myself, but you cast it on that ally. They get that little boost to defense, and then they can make a reaction attack. So you're technically giving them both a boost to defense and to offense. And of course, because we are multiclassing two full spellcasters, our spell slot progression continues as if we were a single-classed, full spellcaster. And that also means that every other level we're going to have a spell slot that is a higher level than any spells we can cast. So it makes it so that having an upcast option is a good idea. We're going to just go straight sorcerer from here out. Clockwork Soul gives us more than enough here. At second level we're going to get Font of Magic. That's basically our sorcery points. At this point, we don't have meta magic, so we'll use them to basically switch into a spell slot. Gives us a little more casting. And we're going to add one first level spell, and that spell will be Absorb Elements. This increases our defensive options with our reaction. And we're going to make a switch on our Clockwork Magic, and we're going to take Alarm, and we're going to switch it for Armor of Agathis. This is a great switch for us. And Armor of Agathis, again, not normally available to sorcerers, but Clockwork Soul can access it through Clockwork Magic by second level. And speaking of spells that upcast great, Armor of Agathis gives us a good option right off the bat. And we're going to have a couple really good upcasting options, but Armor of Agathis is always going to be one of them because it scales very, very well. Armor of Agathis is a one-hour duration spell with no concentration, and it gives you five temporary hit points, and anytime somebody hits you, it is going to take five points of cold damage. And that is any melee attack. Now, once your temporary hit points are completely gone, then that doesn't take effect anymore. So it actually has kind of a exponential value when we upcast it because our temporary hit points are going to increase by five and the damage increases by five for every spell level we add. So it's five and five at level one. 10 and 10 at level 2. I mean, that is a massive amount of difference because quite often those attacks aren't necessarily going to remove all 10. So if we can have it take effect more than once, that's really good. It also just increases the beefiness of your character. So Armor of Agathis, remember as a second level Clockwork Magic Sorcerer, we're actually a third level character and we have second level spells what are we going to cast with our second level spells? I think Armor of Agathis is actually a really good choice. But it's a spell I'm going to keep on my spell list right to level 20. Now at level 4 for this character, we're going to gain level 3 Sorcerer. So with level 3 Sorcerer, we're now going to have Meta Magic. The two Meta Magics I'm going to select are Twin Spell and Subtle Spell. Now the thing about Twin Spell is that at high levels, when we are affecting high level spells with it, it's really, really expensive in terms of sorcery points. For low level spells, it's actually dirt cheap. So 
putting it on a uh, heroism to select a second creature is probably a better use of our sorcery point than upcasting the heroism. Also, something like a shield of faith, being able to select a second target with it can make it quite good. And it's a single sorcery point. So again, dirt cheap. We're also going to be getting another spell next level that twins very well. The second meta magic I'm going to take is Subtle Spell. Subtle Spell is become maybe my go-to meta magic now, because number one, if you throw a Subtle Spell on a spell, it can't be counterspelled because they can't see you casting. Number two, just from role playing alone, the value of being able to cast spells without anyone knowing it was you is just going to come up and it's going to be fun. And number three, it is also dirt cheap, except Subtle Spell is always dirt cheap. It is one sorcery point to affect any spell. So you have that super, super important high level spell and you want to make sure it's not counterspelled. One sorcery point to put a subtle spell on it is so, so cheap. It's just a no brainer. So at third level, we are going to remove the shield spell. And I know that's going to sound crazy, but just follow along. Well, you'll understand things get a little complicated when we add on Clockwork Soul Sorcery. So in other words, we're going to get Shield again. That's going to give us two Sorcerer selections. And the first one we're going to take is Web. I just think this is the best choice you can have. Web is definitely the best control spell at second level. And it's actually a better control spell than a lot of higher level control spells as well. Second spell we're going to take is Tasha's Mind Whip. And the reason we'll take that is because Tasha's Mind Whip gives us something to do with our spell when we can't give up concentration. Because a lot of spells that this character is going to have are going to be concentration spells. We're going to be maintaining them. So we want to choose a couple spells that we can cast while concentrating on something else. And Tasha's Mind Whip is one that is going to do a pretty reliable source of damage and hits a saving throw that tends to be on the weak side, which is intelligence. And we will probably want to have a spell or two that isn't a cantrip that is going to target intelligence. And we will get another one eventually, but Tasha's Mind Whip is one that's going to do us at these mid-levels. And as a third level Clockwork Magic Sorcerer, you would get Aid and Lesser Restoration. And I'm actually going to keep both of those at third level. And the reason I want to do that is I'm going to switch out protection from evil and good, which is something I don't expect to cast very much, and switch it for shield. So then we can have shield. It's one of our clockwork soul sorcerer spells that gave us that little bit of extra versatility with those tight sorcerer spells. So now we have armor of Agathis and shield as our first level spells. I just can't imagine a better mix of two spells there. And second level, we're going to get aid and lesser restoration. And I want to mention that aid is one of the best healing spells in the game. Now, it is, for one, a spell that upcasts really well. So now, along with Armor of Agathis, we have another really, really effective upcasting spell. Aid is going to give five additional maximum hit points to three party members of your choice. And because it's maximum hit points, it doesn't affect temporary hit points at all. But the second thing Aid does is it immediately provides those three characters five additional current hit points. So by the way I read it, and by the way I've seen it generally played, is even if you cast it on a character with zero hit points, they would immediately jump up to five hit points. So this essentially becomes our healing spell. And it's something that if we had nothing else to do, we could cast it in combat and get that voice of authority involved in it as well. And then Lesser Restoration, this one is circumstantial. It's not something I'm going to keep forever. But when it does come up, it is quite good. And we have a really nice mix of second level spells now. We have Aid, Tasha's Mind Whip, Web, Lesser Restoration. That is a really versatile list. Same thing with first level spells. Very versatile. So when our character gets to level 5, that will be level 4 in Sorcerer for us. That's going to give us our first ability score improvement. And we are going to take a feat. And that feat is Fate Touched which also increases our Charisma by 1. So now we're sitting on a Charisma of 18. We're going to get the Misty Step spell. We're also going to be able to cast Misty Step once per day without using a spell slot. And we're going to get an additional spell that we can cast once per day without expending a spell slot. And that spell will be Tasha's Hideous Laughter. 
Now I mentioned in a previous video that Gift of Alacrity is a really good choice and I think Gift of Alacrity here is a really good choice as well. And if your DM is going to allow Gift of Alacrity, I would be tempted to take that instead of Tasha's Hideous Laughter, though I think they're both good options. The reason I'm selecting Tasha's Hideous Laughter here is this build doesn't rely on Gift of Alacrity and Tasha's Hideous Laughter is going to be available because it's a player's handbook spell and it works really well here. Tasha's Hideous Laughter is probably the best first level spell to twin because you can incapacitate two different creatures and it costs one sorcery point to twin. Super cheap for a fantastic effect that you're not even going to have to spend a spell slot on. We're going to get one additional cantrip. The cantrip I'm going to select is Message. We're just getting into the utility cantrips here. and You could take something else if you want, but Message is a good utility cantrip, so that's what I'm grabbing. Now we are fourth level now. It's time to get rid of sleep. That is going to give us two additional second level options, and we're going to select Enlarge Reduce as our first option. As a buff, this is pretty minor most of the time. I mean, it's a D4 additional on each attack that a creature makes if you enlarge them. You can also technically reduce an enemy. They get a constitution save, and if they make it, nothing happens. But this can also turn anyone with a decent strength into a pretty good grappler as well. And there's utility on top of it. So enlarge reduce is actually a pretty versatile spell. And remember that if we cast it on an ally as a buff, they're also going to get that reaction attack. Second, I'm going to pick up Mirror Image for defense. It's just a good defensive spell, and it doesn't use our concentration. And with our Clockwork Magic, we're going to switch out Lesser Restoration for Levitate. Again, Levitate is a wonderfully versatile spell. And we might cast it on an ally so that they could attack a flying enemy. And you can levitate them, and then they can attack as a reaction because of our Voice of Authority. So at 6th level, we gain our 5th level of Sorcerer. This is a big level for us, so I'm going to take a little bit of extra time here. First thing I'll say, we get Magical Guidance. This allows us to spend one Sorcery point to reroll a d20 whenever we fail an ability check. And we're going to have multiple ways to use our ability checks here, which I'll discuss. Number 2, we're going to get 3rd level spells. And I am going to select Fireball. And there are probably some watchers who go, why would you select Fireball when you're the one who says Hypnotic Pattern so great and Fear so great? Why Fireball? Because Fireball at 5th level is fantastic. It's every bit as good as Hypnotic Pattern and Fear. Because a lot of creatures are outright killed by a Fireball at this level, and that's better than incapacitating them. The range is amazing, and the area of effect is is just bigger than we're going to get with a fear spell or a hypnotic pattern so we can affect more enemies. My issue with fireball as a selection for spells has always been that I find that it doesn't continue to be effective at higher levels. But a fifth level fireball is great and that's one advantage of playing a sorcerer. Once you play a wizard you get two spells per level and if you select Fireball, that's another spell you didn't select and you've got Fireball in your spell book for the rest of your career. But with a Sorcerer, we can take Fireball when it's sweet and switch it out for something else when it's not so sweet. So I do think Fireball is a great selection here and Fireball at 5th level is a lot of fun. And we are going to get two Clockwork Soul Sorcerer spells which would normally be protection from energy into spell magic. but because we don't need to switch any of our other Clockwork Magic spells, we're going to switch Protection for Energy for Counterspell. So we are getting, this is just so good, our Clockwork Soul Sorcerer has got Fireball, but we also have Dispel Magic and Counterspell. These are both circumstantial spells, but incredibly useful spells. They are also spells that often rely on an ability check. It really depends on the level of spell that we're trying to dispel or counter. And as a sorcerer, with one sorcery point, we can re-roll a failed check. This is going to make us better at Dispel Magic and Counterspell than a lot of wizards are. And just throwing those on as extra spells on our third level list when we're a sixth level caster, it's just so good. We have six really good Clockwork Magic spells. And we have six normal sorcerer spells for a total of 12 great spells. 
and that's not counting our cleric spells at all. If we were a wizard of this level, we would be preparing nine wizard spells. So we are out spelling the wizard in terms of spell versatility by a third. Now, ritual spells are another matter. Wizard straight out wins on ritual spells. But in terms of just straight spell versatility for non-ritual spells, for spells that we might be casting in combat, we just have greater versatility than that wizard is going to have. That's amazing. That's something opposite of what we normally had with a sorcerer. And nobody does this better than clockwork. So when we look at our sixth level character, if we've gotten plate mail, we're up to a 20 armor class. And by sixth level, we may have plate mail. If we don't, we're just going to be sitting at either an 18 or a 19, depending on whether we're using chain mail or splint. One way or another, our armor class is good. We have mirror image. We have shield. Defensively, super strong. Also, our hit points. 51 hit points at 6th level for a full caster is almost unheard of. But because we mixed Hill Dwarf with a high constitution, that's why we've got so many hit points. And remember, because we are Dwarf, we're moving around in that plate armor and we have no penalties from having an 8 strength. A plus 6 constitution save, not a bad save for concentration. We have to get pretty unlucky to fail our concentration saves. Still, that is something that is going to need some more attention at some point. I'll also point out that our other saving throws are not very good. We've got a plus one wisdom save, plus zero dexterity save, and that's going to be pretty common with characters of this level. You just can't have everything, but we can improve it, and we will. We have eight useful cantrips. Adding more cantrips at this point, I think, would be largely a waste. We just have so much we can do already. So you see eight first level spells here. Keep in mind, protection from evil and good is not on this list, nor is alarm. We have armor of Agathis and shield instead. But eight spells of first level you have to choose from, and a lot of them are circumstantial. Absorb elements doesn't come up all the time. Heroism doesn't come up all the time. I mean, even shield is technically circumstantial. And although we only have four slots, remember, we can cast Tasha's Hideous Laughter without a spell slot. And we should do that every single day. And we have seven second level spells here. Again, just really good spells that can do a lot of different things. We have multiple saving throws that we can target. We have spells that use concentration, spells that don't use concentration. And several of these spells will benefit from our voice of authority. Then at third level, we're going to have Counterspell, Dispel Magic, and Fireball. Three slots. We might cast Fireball three times. It all depends. Dispel Magic, Counterspell, both circumstantial, but both really, really good spells. Playing this character at sixth level is going to be terrific because just that selection of spells is so good. Now you get that to some degree playing a cleric, but generally speaking, Domain spells on a cleric are nothing to write home about. Here we're getting to basically take domain spells, but customize them into the perfect list. And if a cleric could do that, then I would be playing clerics all the time, and they'd be my favorite class in the game. So let's get back into leveling up. And so we'll take our sorcerer to level 6. That's character level 7. And we get an ability I think is underrated. And that's Bastion of Law. Now, I, before I mentioned, I thought this ability was pretty good. And I got a, got a couple comments saying, it's not very good because Aberrant Minds have a great ability at level 6. And they do. But Bastion of Law is still a really good ability. You spend 1 to 5 sorcery points to create a magical ward. It reduces damage you take by a d8 per sorcery point spent. And the reason I like Bastion of Law so much on a Clockwork Soul Sorcerer is because with Clockwork Magic we get Armor of Agathis, or at least we can choose Armor of Agathis, and we should choose Armor of Agathis, because Bastion of Law and Armor of Agathis are natural bedfellows, because Bastion of Law stacks with Armor of Agathis, which, by the way, stacks with aid that we can also get through Clockwork Magic. So aid, Armor of Agathis, Bastion of Law, defensively, we are a rock. But in addition to that, Bastion of Law is going to prevent us losing our temporary hit points from Armor of Agathis. That means creatures that 
have the nerve to actually attack us with a melee weapon are going to get punished and punished and punished more than you would with a normal Armor of Agathis character because we can pad those temporary hit points. And the more it takes for them to get rid of all those temporary hit points, the more damage they're going to take from that Armor of Agathis. So Bastion of Law and a Clockwork Soul Sorcerer can give us a similar interaction to Arcane Ward for an Abjuration Wizard, except that Abjuration Wizard would need to multiclass to get Armor of Agathis. We get it right through Sorcerer. So I just think this is a really good ability, and I agree. The 6th level ability on Aberrant Mind Sorcerer is fantastic, and I've said so. But I think this is really good, and the fact that Aberrant Mind has a better 6th level ability doesn't take away from the fact that Clockwork Soul Sorcerer is at 6th level. I'll play one over an Aberrant Mind Sorcerer. Show me a spell list that you're getting with your Aberrant Mind Sorcerer at level 6 that compares to my spell list. So at 6th level, we're going to get an additional spell known through Sorcerer, and we're going to select Fly. Fly is a very useful spell, as you know, uses our concentration, but it upcasts well as well, because we can upcast it and affect multiple party members. Fly is a spell I probably wouldn't twin. I'd be more inclined to spend that 4th level slot, then spend 3 sorcery points to twin it. Now the workings of Fly are different than Levitate, and I think it's important to mention that, because with Levitate, it is us who makes that creature go up or down. So the way Voice of Authority works with Levitate is they will take their levitation movement and then attack. But with Fly, the way it would work is we would cast Fly on them and then they would make their attack from their current position. And then on their turn, they can move. And this actually means that there's certain times that Levitate is going to be better than Fly. And there are certain times that Fly is going to be better than Levitate. So I think it's worthwhile to keep both on our build. Next thing we're going to do is with our third level spells, and I need to explain this because people are going to go crazy, but I'm going to switch to Spell Magic for Haste. Now, why do I do that? If you look at my ratings for spells, I don't rate Haste higher than to Spell Magic. So why would I make that change? Here is the thing about Haste. Haste always works. There are going to be creatures that are immune to non-magical attacks. There are going to be creatures that are immune to the energy attack that you normally rely on. There are going to be creatures that have the saving throws they need to pass against your save or suck spells. Even with our restore balance, that isn't enough to make sure creatures are going to fail. And in addition, a lot of these creatures might even have legendary resistance on top of that, especially as we get into higher levels. And there are creatures who can teleport as legendary actions. We are going to face creatures where it's going to feel like we can't do anything useful unless we have some buffing options. And haste is not a spell that particularly feels dramatic when you cast it. One additional attack per turn big deal. But it can actually be more than one attack per turn. And the reason for that is we play on a battlefield and we don't play on a whiteboard. And sometimes you got that melee character and if they didn't have that double movement speed, they will make zero attacks on their turn. So haste can make that difference and give them the additional attack, plus the bonus to armor class, plus the advantage on dexterity saving throws. And remember that that creature can dash, disengage, hide, or use an object with that action as well. But no, haste is not dramatic. And if I have another spell that I think is effective against the enemy, that is a battlefield control or a debuff, I'd be more inclined to do that. But having haste as a backup for when battlefield control isn't going to help you because they're teleporting wherever they want. Maybe they're immune to grappled and restrained. Maybe they've got a freedom of movement spell on them as well. And our debuffs just aren't going to work because their saving throws are amazing. And maybe they're a single enemy, so those mass effect save or sucks just aren't a good option because casting a hypnotic pattern on one creature, I'd say, is normally not a good use of your spell slot. But haste always works, and it creates a nudge. Haste will never win you a fight, but will often give you a little advantage that has your side win over the enemy. 
And if you have a chance to do nothing or haste, haste can often have a dramatic impact to the end result of a combat, even if you don't feel that dramatically on a round by round basis. Other thing about haste is we can twin it. It's not cheap to twin, but if we twin it, we're going to get double the effect. So let's go to seventh level. And more pretty dramatic stuff happens here because we have access to fourth level spells, but also because we are a clockwork soul sorcerer. First thing, we're an eighth level character. We had our fun with fireball. Time for it to go. I'm going to switch it to hypnotic pattern on this character, but fear is a good option as well. And I'm going to select one fourth level spell. That's going to be Dimension Door. Dimension Door, massively useful fourth level spell because we can take along an ally. That's really the key there. And so what happens is you're in a fight and one of your allies is in a rough spot. Maybe their hit points are down to almost nothing. Maybe they're in the mouth of an enemy and they're about to be swallowed. In fact, they can even be swallowed already. And you can use Dimension Door because they just have to be within five feet of you. So you move up to that creature that's in a tough spot. You cast Dimension Door. You save them. Simple as that. No concentration. Which means that we don't have to give up on that spell we were already concentrating on. Then with our Clockwork Soul spells, we're going to switch. We normally get Freedom of Movement and Summon Construct. But we're going to switch Freedom of Movement, which actually is tempting to keep because freedom of movement doesn't come up all that often but when it does it's really good um, but i'm going to suggest we switch it to polymorph because polymorph as i've mentioned many times is an amazing spell but it also works exceptionally well with our voice of authority because often what we polymorph somebody into like we polymorph somebody into a t-rex we have one really powerful attack with that t-rex so you cast Polymorph, they get their Voice of Authority. As a T-Rex, they're not using their reaction unless it's an opportunity attack anyway. So they can use their reaction right away, make that big, big attack with it, plus the normal benefits of Polymorph. So we just use Polymorph better than other spellcasters do. And then Summon Construct. Now, Summon Construct is not my favorite of the new summoning spells, but one thing that all the new summoning spells have is number one, they tend to be non-disruptive. They go right after you. They're easy to use. You cast it, they go immediately. You don't have to worry about they rolled initiative and they happen to roll initiative just above you. So now you've got to wait a whole turn before they can do anything. Summon Construct's going to get to go right away. Number two, it is a one action cast, which means you can have it where you need it, when you need it. Number three, there is a significant advantage to it being a single action creature. A lot of summoning spells rely on you getting multiple creatures in order for them to be effective at all, but there are disadvantages to that. That again, it's one of those whiteboard optimization things that you don't think about, but area of effect spells obviously are a big deal against multiple creatures with few hit points, but more importantly, it's the battlefield, right? You look at a battle map and if you're on an open field, having more creatures might actually be better. But in a lot of cases, we are going through dungeons or indoors. And space is an issue and movement is an issue. And getting those eight creatures, even to positions where they can attack, without hindering allies, is often impossible. Summon Construct is not going to have that problem. The other thing I really like about Summon Construct is that sorcerers don't get summoning spells. Look through your sorcerer spell list. Summoning just isn't there. So Summon Construct gives us a summoning spell. And I talked about spell versatility, and this increases it. Now, my problem with Summon Construct is that it does bludgeoning damage. And that means we can be facing resistances and immunities. And that's not ideal. So if I had my choice of summonings, Construct wouldn't be my first choice. But we have some secondary abilities with it, and they're versatile, right? We can choose whether we're choosing the metal, stone, or clay version, and they all have additional things they can do. And again, it's just something that sorcerers can't normally do. So Summon Construct is something I'm going to keep. And that brings us to ninth level. And we are going to get an ability score improvement, and I recommend here we take a feat, and the feat I recommend 
is resilient wisdom. Now we could go for something to boost our concentration saves here, but our concentration saves aren't that weak and our wisdom save is concerning at a plus one. This is going to effectively provide us a plus five to our wisdom saves. Four from proficiency and one because we're boosting our wisdom from a 13 to a 14. That is a big boost on that save. And wisdom saves happen. And one thing about wisdom saves, they may not be as common as, say, dexterity saves, but they are often more debilitating. And if we look at our saving throws here, our constitution save is good, but our wisdom save now is good too, and that just feels a lot better. The dexterity save it is what it is, and we're never going to be able to get proficiency in dexterity saves. So we're going to have to hope on things like counter spell to protect us from dexterity effects, or we're going to fail our saving throw a lot. And the thing about dexterity saving throws is that most of the time, it's to avoid damage. Here's what this character does have. Probably increased max hit points through aid, potentially increased temporary hit points through armor of Agathis. In addition, potentially damage reducers like Bastion of Law. And we have a ton of hit points because we have a constitution of 16 and we are a hill dwarf. So if we are going to ignore a saving throw, dexterity is the one to ignore. We're gonna get one additional spell known now we already have a list of three good fourth level spells. So we're gonna get an additional spell. Might as well grab another fourth level spell, but maybe try to do something a little different with it. I'm gonna take greater invisibility. Like with haste, this is a spell that is going to be a buff spell that may not seem dramatic, but can make a big difference. It also is something that is very likely to benefit from our voice of authority. And once again, if we did convince another player to play a rogue, they're going to feel fantastic because we are going to be giving them so many reaction attacks with this character. And greater invisibility is just another way we're going to do it. And we're going to throw advantage on that attack as well. As for our clockwork magic, I'm changing nothing. This is the list I want. Armor of Agathis, Shield, Aid, Levitate, Haste, Counterspell, Polymorph, Summon Construct. I wouldn't change a thing. And that brings us to ninth level in Sorcerer, so a 10th level character. So we're right at the end of tier two. And what we would normally get for our fifth level spells for Clockwork Sorcerer is Wall of Force and Greater Restoration. I'm going to switch Greater Restoration for Transmute Rock. Why? Because I think Transmute Rock will come up more. It is a great battlefield control that does not need your concentration. And those are rare. And then Wall of Force is the most powerful spell at 5th level, in my opinion. And no other sorcerer is getting Wall of Force. Only Clockwork. And look at this spell list. And right now we have 10 spells on this list, and we will have 10 spells on our sorcerer list. Meaning that we have twice as many spells as the average sorcerer. And they're all good spells. And they do a vast number of different things. Some use concentration, some do not. Some buff allies, some debuff enemies, some control the battlefield. We are always going to have a spell solution for a problem. And speaking of being versatile, I'm going to take Synaptic Static as my fifth level spell through Sorcerer. I'm not convinced at all that Synaptic Static is the most powerful fifth level Sorcerer spell available. With Tashes, I think it's potentially Bigby's Hand, though Animate Objects is really good, Telekinesis is really good. But the thing about Synaptic Static is it works better with what our character can do. We can continue concentrating on that Greater Invisibility or that Polymorph, and we can cast our Synaptic Static. And we can hit a bunch of enemies at long range, do some damage, we don't have a lot of damage spells, and cause a debuff on top of it. And the only intelligence saving throw spells we have right now is a second level spell and a cantrip. So this also gives us an intelligence save spell that is a decent level spell. But I want to mention something because I have played now with multiple players who have synaptic static and they throw it at a single enemy. Don't do that. That's not a good tactical move. If you're fighting a single enemy and you only have area of effect options, then buff an ally. 
So level 10 is the greatest number of known spells for our level that we're ever going to have. I would expect a wizard to have prepared 14, maybe 15 spells at this level. We have 23 spells we can choose from. This kind of versatility you just don't see in the game, again, except for clerics and aberrant mind sorcerers. But our spell list is significantly more comprehensive than either of those options. With 11th level, first we're going to get our third meta magic option. You're going to like this one. The choice is careful spell. And I will get told that you cast something like a fireball, for example, and you use careful spell, well, your allies are still going to take damage. It just gives them a successful saving throw. Because careful spell is not like the evoker ability in that we don't eliminate the effect of the spell. But the thing about careful spell is when you have an area of effect spell like a hypnotic pattern and you throw it on a bunch of enemies, if you happen to catch an ally, they're not going to be affected by it, but they are still a target of the spell. So with careful spell, it actually might be advantageous to throw an ally within the hypnotic pattern and use a super cheap one sorcery point careful spell meta magic and give that ally that weapon attack. I could even see something with synaptic static here. Like if I had a choice of hitting two enemies with a synaptic static or three enemies with a synaptic static, but I'm also going to catch an ally, I would definitely consider using a careful spell and that ally is going to take really little damage and they're not going to have that secondary effect while all the enemies are making intelligent saves to avoid the full damage and the secondary effect. And again, they're going to get that reaction attack on top of it. Now at this point, I'm not making any more changes with my clockwork magic because it is the perfect list for me and I don't want to change it at all. But of course, we're going to continue to gain sorcery spells and the first thing we're going to get is another cantrip. So I'm just going to grab Prestidigitation here, but take whatever you want. And we're going to get an additional spell known. And we have such a lovely list of spells, but what if we are fighting that single enemy and we want to cast a 5th level spell? And Synaptic Static isn't the spell we want to cast. Transmute Rock, not necessarily a spell we want to cast against a single enemy. Wall of Force is often a spell we use to separate enemies. So again, not necessarily a spell we want to cast against a single enemy. What's a spell we want to cast against a single enemy? Bigby's hand. Now we could choose telekinesis here and I think that's an okay option as well. But Bigby's hand is a good choice for us here. Lots of nice options for us to do. If I'm going to concentrate on a high level spell against a single target, Bigby's hand is a good choice. And at level 11, I am just super confident that this character can pretty much have an option for every challenge. Sometimes the option is just going to win the fight. Things like Wall of Force might just win the fight. Even Hypnotic Pattern might just win the fight. But we have a lot of spells for when those save or I win spells just aren't appropriate. When it comes to buffing, debuffing, battlefield control. Armor of Agathis, well, it's self-buff and damage spell. Shield, self-buff. Aid is a buff for allies. Levitate can be a debuff or a buff. Haste, buff. Counterspell, debuff. Polymorph, buff can be a debuff as well. Summon Construct can be a battlefield control. Transmute Rock, battlefield control. Wall of Force, battlefield control. Absorb Elements, self-buff. Bless, good buff, even at this level. Heroism, useful buff. Shield of Faith, buff. Enlarge, reduce, buff, debuff. Mirror Image, self-buff. Misty Step, technically battlefield control. Because teleports generally are. Tasha's Mind Whip, debuff. Web, battlefield control. Fly, buff. Hypnotic Pattern, debuff. Dimension Door, battlefield control. Greater Invisibility, buff. Bigby's Hand, tends to be a battlefield control or a debuff. Synaptic Static, debuff. We have a really nice selection of all these kinds of spells. And in some cases, they're better against single targets. And in some cases, they're better against multiple targets. In some cases, we're hitting a weak save. In other cases, we're getting a bigger area. Again, the point of this kind of caster is, no matter what your situation, you have the solution. I never want to turn 
where I look at my spells and go, well, I guess there's nothing I can do. This character is built to not have that happen. And that brings us into tier three. And so I am going to go through the rest of the levels very quickly. Level 11 sorcerer, level 12 character. We add scatter to our six level spell list. So good. Amazing battlefield control and also works well, guess what, with voice of authority. Move all your allies right where they need to be and one of them gets a free weapon attack as well. Or we move enemies or we move some allies and some enemies. And it doesn't use our concentration. Scatter is a fantastic spell. Level 12 Sorcerer, level 13 character. We take Warcaster. The advantage on constitution saving throws, very useful. Now remember, this isn't the only kind of concentration saves you need to make. Sometimes you need to make concentration saves because you're trying to resist a spell that will incapacitate you, for example. But most concentration saves you make are from damage. Warcaster is going to make it so that as we get to these higher levels and the damage we start to take might be more than 20, might even be a fair bit more than 20, that we're still going to have a chance to make those constitution saving throws. Also, we're wearing a shield. We should have a hand free for casting, but what if we have a staff or a wand? There's reasons why we might have our hands full. Warcaster just takes care of those somatic components for us. No new spells at level 13. So level 14 character, we now get our first seventh level spell. I recommend reverse gravity. Really good chance you're going to be able to use reverse gravity with your seventh level slot. Remember, we do have uh, upcastable spells that are pretty good if we can't. But reverse gravity can really control a battlefield. And once again, this might be a spell that's not such a big deal if it hits a party member. And then they can take advantage of our voice of authority. Level 14 sorcerer, level 15 character. We get no new spells at this level. We do get a clockwork soul ability. Trance of Order. This is a bonus action, so you can use this on the same turn that you cast an action spell. It gives you a 10 round effect. During that time, attack rolls can have advantage. And whether you make an attack roll, an ability check, or a saving throw, you can treat a roll of 9 or lower on the d20 as a 10. When is this good? Whenever we're going to use Counterspell. It basically is going to right away make our minimum roll on a Counterspell capable of automatically countering 5th or lower level spells. As soon as we increase our Charisma, it'll be 6 or lower. And saving throws, 10 or higher guaranteed, is likely going to make our concentration saves pretty much free from concerns for losing due to taking damage. You're going to use it in your big fight, of course, and it's not using your concentration. And as I said, the bonus action is not overly intrusive. 16th level character, 15th level sorcerer. I wish I had something good to say here, but sorcerer, 8th level spells suck, and Clockwork Soul doesn't help us here. And there's none of the sorcerer subclasses that help you because even the cleric list is bad at 8th level. So even if you're a divine soul sorcerer, you still have a bad list here. I'm recommending Sunburst. It is going to be by far our biggest area of effect spell. 120 feet across. Does damage and it blinds. Undead and oozes have disadvantage on the saving throw, so pretty good against hordes of undead. And it wipes out any kind of magical darkness. It's not a great spell, but it's an okay spell and it's the best option we've got. Level 17, level 16 sorcerer, we get no new spells. This level is going to feel terrible if somebody went straight caster for 17th level. But I find, generally, they don't. It's interesting, this month I will be doing a 17th level one-shot for my Archmages, and suddenly we're seeing all kinds of straight casters. And we've seen almost none since I've started doing this. So we get our ability score improvement. Let's get our Charisma up to 20. Level 18, we can now get to Sorcerer 17, and we get our all-important 9th level spell. But there are actually two 9th level spells I want on this character, so I'm going to get rid of Greater Invisibility. The first ninth level spell I will naturally take as Wish, which is definitely the best spell on this list. Now I think it's probably the best spell on the list for Wizards as well, but Wizards, it's a little closer. 
true polymorph is really, really tempting. And actually shape change is surprisingly tempting as well. And I think things like foresight are just solid. We could take something like extend spell and foresight all day. There's nothing wrong with that. It's not as powerful as wish, but it's still pretty good. But here, you know, power word kill, psychic scream, gate, these are not screaming out to me. But the one that I still want, because I think it is still a good spell for ninth level, is Meteor Swarm. These are the two ninth level spells I want from this list, so I'm going to take them both. From this point on, we don't get any more spells with Sorcerer. So this is the point. Let's go ahead and take the spell list we want. I want to have two ninth level spells that I might cast, which of course is the most powerful spell in the game, but Meteor Swarm is actually a pretty solid ninth level spell, and it's a ton of fun. It's actually smaller than a Sunburst, but while a Sunburst is doing 12d8 damage, this one is doing 40d6 damage. And we can cast it at a mile range. And then the last two levels of this character, we get another Clockwork Soul ability at level 18 Sorcerer, or level 19 for our character, and it's actually quite good if you actually get to this level. First we'll get another Metamagic. I recommend Extend, but we get this really nice ability at level 18. One action, we can restore 100 hit points divided among creatures by our choice. So this is a little bit like a mini mass heal spell significantly more valuable than a regular heal spell. Second, any damaged objects within the cube are repaired instantly. Most of the time that doesn't come into effect. And every six level or spell or lower that we choose ends on creatures. So like a dispel magic wherever we want it, except we don't need to roll for any spell six level or lower. And we can do this once for free. Doing it again would require seven sorcery points. I think it's worth seven sorcery points. And finally at level 20, our final ability score improvement, you could take whatever you want. I'm going to take tough just because I want to have a ridiculous amount of hit points with a sorcerer at level 20. Not very often are you going to see a caster 20th level with over 200 hit points. And it's way more than 200 hit points. 200 base hit points because of our aid and our armor of Agathis and our bastion of law. We have a lot of ways to improve that. We're going to have a good armor class on top of that and a good chance of increasing that armor class with spells or magic items. Our saving throws, about as good as you can expect for a sorcerer. We're going to have a 9 constitution, 8 wisdom, 11 charisma. Spells much more than most sorcerers and much better than I think any other subclass of sorcerer can possibly achieve. And we've just saw a great synergy with Cleric here. How often during this video have I mentioned, and this works with voice of authority. I mean, it feels like I've been saying it every two minutes. As I mentioned, I think this character works exceptionally well, and I will be playing it. Because this, to me, gives me the things that I love from Wizard. Except in some cases, it does them better than Wizard. Now, I'll miss rituals. I'm not going to lie. In fact, I would be even tempted to go and grab Ritual Caster with a feat. Though I'd have to grab it at low level and that would kind of be painful. So I don't know about that. But for leveled spells, spells we're going to cast in combat, I love to have tactical options. I love to look at the specific situation on the battlefield and go, okay, I need a spell that it's going to hit this big an area. And it's good against single targets or multiple targets. Or my area of effect spells aren't going to work, so I need single target spells or buff spells. This character just has a solution for everything. So hopefully it's clear why I call him Tough the Buff. He is tough and he buffs. So I hope you enjoyed this build. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. Until next time, I'm going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks everybody. Talk to you soon. Mm -hmm.